So I believe we're going live. YouTube tells me we are live. I'm just having a little bit of technical difficulty here. My uh, my hard drive, um, external hard drive, is just I need just to re uh, restart it, and might have to change the cable. Give me one second. Okay, sure. No problem at all. Okay, now I think we're working. All right, I'll also put uh, the link on the chat. All right, uh, perfect. So uh, we will have a, a final uh, keynote lecture uh, for this uh, three-day uh, workshop uh, we have been running with uh, Antiope Koronaki uh, and myself from Italy, for the last three days um, for Digital Futures. Um, we have been looking into uh, automating uh, timber manufacturing uh, and uh, optimizing uh, uh, the design for uh, fabrication and assembly um, uh, purposes. Uh, we want to discuss today, uh, also uh, accompanied by uh, Matt uh, Rollins from ABB, uh, about uh, the introduction of uh, automation technologies and uh, industrial robotics in the construction uh, industry. Uh, we want to start a general discussion uh, in regards to um, what are uh, the current obstacles that we see, uh, what are the opportunities, uh, how uh, digital workflows uh, can allow and facilitate uh, the implementation of these technologies uh, in our everyday uh, activities as designers. Uh, so I will do a first uh, brief introduction uh, of uh, the point of view of data from lab, and then I'll pass over uh, the presentation to Matt uh, to present us uh, from the ABB uh, side. Uh, so let me start sharing my screen. All right. Yes. Can you see it? Uh, yeah. I think there's just a delay from the live streaming, but I guess we, it will appear soon. We can see this, uh, your screen. Okay. Sorry, just give me one second. Yeah, all right. Uh, so uh, I will present this part uh, from uh, the point of view of uh, data from lab. Uh, first of all, discussing about uh, the construction industry. Uh, it's really interesting to start uh, understanding um, what we mean by industry 4.0. Uh, this is a term that has been uh, mentioned so many times uh, over the past few years. Uh, and there are many different aspects of industry 4.0. Uh, one of them is automation and robotics alongside with smart materials, big data and uh, internet of things, 
artificial intelligence, uh, cloud services, VR and AR, uh, and BIM, of course. Uh, the interesting thing is that we talk a lot about these things, but inside the construction industry, uh, the spending for uh, research and development is very low. Um, and it's very, very low in comparison to other industries. So what that means is that very often uh, we see that uh, we replicate existing processes uh, using automation technologies without taking into account uh, the actual application uh, of uh, what it means to, for example, to have a robot laying bricks when uh, the brick is a very specific material that has dimensions that correspond to uh, the dimensions of our hands. Uh, so the brick was made with the thought that people are going to be laying those bricks with their hands. Uh, and when we actually put a robot to lay bricks, uh, it does make the process a little bit more efficient, but it doesn't change fundamental, uh, fundamentally the methodologies we use in construction. So we end up using the same processes that we have been using for 100 years or so, uh, just with different uh, means. And also uh, sometimes uh, being um, like amazed by the technology itself, uh, we need to uh, think a little bit more critically whether uh, we actually solve the problem or we overcomplicate a situation. Uh, so an Android robot just to be standing, to be holding a plasterboard is a very difficult thing to, uh, to make. Uh, instead of a person uh, holding um, this plasterboard. And that's why we see that although these new technologies are being implemented slowly in the construction industry, the productivity index has not changed. It has been almost flat uh, for the past uh, years. Also in comparison to other industries that have been revolutionized using automation technologies. And there are many slow integration factors, but one of the most important uh, that uh, we have identified uh, is that uh, we have a designer uh, who generates a very complex geometry and then needs to figure out how this is going to be fabricated. And there is a gap between uh, the two uh, stages, the stage of design and the stage of fabrication, uh, where files need to be exchanged uh, from the designer uh, and the fabricator between them. Uh, and that costs a lot of money and a lot uh, of uh, lost time uh, because uh, geometries need to be rationalized to be fed back uh, in the system for fabrication. Instead, what should be happening is that uh, advanced fabrication technologies should be understood for architectural practice and design should focus more on manufacturing performance, uh, which is uh, quite essentially what we have been looking in our workshop uh, the past three days. So we're trying to merge the boundaries between the technology and the design. Uh, these were uh, some of the issues that uh, we identified and uh, uh, led to founding uh, Dataform Lab. Uh, the aim of uh, Dataform Lab as a company is uh, to accelerate the integration of industrial robotics in the construction industry. Uh, and that being said, uh, we're trying to achieve that uh, through designing, prototyping, and automating, uh, through developing design to fabrication workflows, uh, using uh, robotic prototyping to ensure uh, manufacturability at an early design stage, and through automation consultancy at the business level. Uh, aiming to de-risk technology innovation uh, for uh, the architecture, engineering, and construction industry. So technically, we are trying to uh, bring design uh, closer to the concept of manufacturing performance and create digital workflows that will allow all uh, designers and architects uh, to use them uh, in their everyday activities. Uh, we don't want this to be something just for specialists. Uh, we also use robotic prototyping and other types of prototyping to check for manufacturability. So we want to make sure that all designs uh, that uh, are being generated are manufacturable. We're not going to face uh, any uh, obstacles or any problems at the very end uh, of the process. Uh, and last but not least, it's really important, uh, we're looking into automation consultancy. 
uh, to make sure that introducing robotics in construction is not just a technology trend, that there is a strong business case and uh, business plan uh, behind the integration of automation uh, for off-site uh, manufacturing and construction. Uh, and for that, it's not just about uh, how to program a robot, so how to create uh, the robotic digital twin simulation, uh, but we're also looking into uh, robotic cell design and optimization and off-site facility planning. Uh, I want to give just a small example of uh, design automation. Uh, this is a project uh, that we worked on uh, last year. Uh, it's a, a facade uh, which has all these panels, they are uh, um, mass customized. Uh, each one is different from the other. Uh, they are interlocking with each other, so they are sharing uh, uh, geometrical features, uh, if you want. Uh, and it's part of a hybrid uh, facade system uh, where you can see that uh, it's not just uh, these panels, there are structure, uh, structural elements behind uh, bracketry, uh, glass facade, uh, and so on. Now, what is important to think uh, when we talk about data-driven design is that uh, we need to allow the user or uh, the client, name it uh, as you want, or the architect, uh, if they are using this tool, uh, to have a certain degree of uh, control uh, and have a user interface. Uh, and there we can uh, allow control for uh, sunlight permeability, uh, the scale of these panels, uh, the facade global pattern, uh, level of insulation, uh, materiality, and so on. So here you see an example of uh, the facade pattern uh, being manipulated uh, by the user, and that uh, being linked directly to a, a parametric uh, model generates uh, the facade parametric model with all the panels um, uh, in place. Uh, now, what is happening is that at the individual panel level, uh, what is happening behind the stage is that we have certain design parameters. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, the inclination of the surfaces, for example. And uh, for those, we have uh, specified the rules uh, for the robot to uh, be able to make them. Uh, so this is a general workflow. Uh, uh, the client uh, is always at the beginning of the process uh, using uh, the interface. Uh, we have the design intention, so we know we're, we're going to make this interlocking uh, triangular panels. Uh, and then uh, we generate a, a facade parametric model, which includes all the other different layers of the facade as well, not just the panels. Uh, and those get uh, modified as uh, the facade panels uh, get modified. Uh, we always check for manufacturability using uh, uh, a link, direct link to robotic fabrication automation. And uh, we close this feedback loop by uh, checking and optimizing for manufacturing performance. So eventually we get as an output all the panels for the fabrication and we have uh, this uh, as data translation into robotic code. So the robot knows exactly what to do, uh, but also we have all the other types of information that we need for construction, a beam model, analytical schedules, and we can further link that to cost analysis, structural detailing, connection design, and so on. So uh, what we do uh, practically is that we create uh, like, pieces of code, uh, plugins uh, that allow uh, the designers and the users to uh, uh, manipulate this parametric model very easily. And then the robot knows exactly uh, what to do uh, to make all these panels uh, appear, let's say, as uh, geometry. So what is really important uh, to think uh, in construction is that now that we have the ability to link directly design and fabrication uh, technologies and automate, uh, automation, uh, so robotics, uh, we don't need to have a very complex uh, geometrical model, which is very heavy, which is something we, all, we also discussed uh, a lot uh, during this workshop. Uh, what we need is the actual data. We need the design data of this facade, uh, similarly to the roof structure that we saw in, uh, in our workshop. Uh, 
Those need to be translated into robotic motion data, uh, similar as uh, what we saw today. Uh, and then we have the robotic fabrication stage and the complex geometry comes at the very end as an evaluation uh, and the visual representation to close this seamless feedback loop. So here, there is a video showing uh, uh, the robot prototyping uh, some of these panels. Uh, we discussed, uh, again, the different types of uh, setups uh, today. Uh, in this case, we chose uh, for the tool to be uh, outside of uh, the robot. So it was a static uh, hardware cutter. The robot was just holding the piece and passing it uh, through to, to make all the um, necessary cuts. And here you can see uh, the final output uh, with all these panels uh, assembled in place. Uh, all of them have uh, their unique uh, ID uh, uh, reference number. So we know which panel we are making every time and where that goes uh, inside the assemble, uh, um, like the bigger uh, facade uh, space. Uh, and of course, because we are following uh, the parametric model, which has uh, all the information embedded, uh, we can link uh, all the details, even the smallest, uh, to the smallest level where the bolts go and how the uh, connection happens uh, at the back of uh, the circuits. Uh, now, what is really important uh, for us to consider as architects, as designers, as engineers, is that uh, if we want to accelerate the introduction uh, and the use of robotics and automation in our industry, we need to work together. So there is no just one discipline that will bring the change. It's not just the architect that needs to start designing for robotics and suddenly everything will, like all the factories will uh, fill up with robots. Neither it is that the factories and the fabricators need to take all the risk uh, and bring in technology that is not yet in demand uh, to prepare themselves for the future. So there is kind of uh, like, it, it needs to be a coordinated effort. And for that reason, we need to have more professional development events where we sit together, we discuss uh, what are the constraints what is the perceived complexity of each uh, profession? Uh, here we had an event last year uh, between uh, ourselves, Data Fund Lab, uh, AKT Structural Engineers, uh, HAL Robotics, uh, speaking uh, from the perspective of the software developers, and Cordec uh, is a very big company uh, in uh, the construction industry uh, making uh, big molds uh, for concrete uh, uh, pouring. Uh, and of course, we need to make sure that uh, there is a certain level of business planning. So what we mean by uh, business planning is uh, what are the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats? So what's the SWOT analysis? These are things borrowed from other uh, disciplines and other industries, but so are, so are robotics. Uh, they were developed for manufacturing. So learning from other disciplines, we need to understand what is the market uh, for these technologies and where do they fit best? Because in my opinion, not everything has to be automated. Uh, there has to be a way to think critically where robotics fit best. And uh, we need to run several business models and test them before suggesting to fabricators, for example, to uh, introduce automation in the process that they have been doing for the past 50 years. Uh, and we need to help them create a value proposition. So uh, how uh, they will be making better things of uh, better quality uh, faster, more efficiently uh, with increased uh, productivity and what the cost uh, structure is for them. So what is the upfront investment? What is their return for uh, uh, of investment? Uh, and these are things that generally, generally as architects, we don't consider, uh, but it's only when we start uh, 
communicating between disciplines uh, that uh, these uh, issues uh, arise. Uh, because in construction, unfortunately, we have uh, the bad habit of being like, isolated in our own bubble. And uh, we always think that our assumptions are always true, but we need more uh, communication. And in order to bring automation and construction, uh, many people ask, why now? First of all, because uh, the maturity uh, of the industry seems to be uh, there. Uh, so we can see initiatives from the UK government uh, building the industrial strategy uh, and setting uh, the goals for 2025 to have a 33% reduction in cost, 50% uh, reduction in the overall time to completion, 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and 50% reduction uh, in the trade gap between exports and imports. Uh, and these are generic rules, but literally, if someone sees those numbers, there is no way those will be achieved without increasing productivity and introducing automation to increase productivity and efficiency. And also, uh, the RIBA, the Royal Institute of British Architects, has set this industrialization mindset that we discussed, uh, where uh, everything is interlinked, so design uh, process interlinked with uh, the off-site fabrication process. Logistics uh, are a very big topic, on-site assembly, uh, and then of course, maintenance. Now the problem uh, that uh, is being uh, faced, well, many problems, is uh, that there is uh, low productivity and high costs uh, in construction. Some of the causes are laid here. Uh, so we have lack of qualified labor, especially in the UK, unexpected site conditions, design changes, communication problems. And I'm gonna stop here because uh, those can be easily tackled by uh, digital workflows and uh, directly linking design to fabrication. So any type of design changes that happen, if there is a parametric model, uh, and parametric workflow uh, linking the design stage and the fabrication stage, uh, this would not uh, affect the final outcome. Communication problems, same. Uh, if everybody is on board using the same uh, parametric model, uh, we can avoid any issues. But we have the feasibility issues and the impracticality of tools and techniques, and that's uh, because we don't really uh, see the bigger picture of how automation is being uh, implemented. So learning from manufacturing, there can be many goals in bringing automation uh, uh, in a process. Do we want to maximize capacity, minimize capacity variability, maximize capacity utilization, minimize lead time? Like eventually everything leads to maximizing profit. That's always one of the goals. But uh, all these different goals have different applications. So uh, in manufacturing, uh, the enemy is uh, variability. So ideally, all manufacturers would like to make the same thing over and over again. Uh, in construction, we have a very big variability. Each project is different from uh, the other. So uh, we need to take uh, all the learnings from manufacturing and translate them for construction. It's not just a borrowing uh, of uh, the application in manufacturing. And the way to be able to measure uh, all these uh, implications is by having the process digital twin. So it's not about uh, just looking at what one robot would be doing, but uh, we need to start simulating the overall offsite uh, process uh, to understand how the supply chain affects uh, bringing in material, uh, what the robotic cells should be doing, uh, how is it linking to other processes in a factory uh, of a fabricator. Uh, and for example, if there is no capacity to deal with what the robot makes further down the line, then we create a bigger problem than what we had before because we need to store whatever our robots make until uh, the next uh, um, uh, stations are ready for them uh, to be 
um, like, uh, assembled or uh, coated or uh, whatever other process uh, is following. Uh, so, uh, so uh, summing up here, uh, and I will pass uh, in a bit to uh, Matt, I think uh, we are at a good uh, current state. Uh, people are uh, considering more uh, modern methods of construction. Uh, they are looking more uh, into uh, modular uh, off-site uh, manufacturing and uh, kit of parts uh, manufacturing, uh, and then assemble on-site. Uh, I think we need to have a bigger push to maximize uh, the potential for the future. Uh, and uh, that's what we are trying to do at Data Form Lab uh, to be able to help companies uh, implement these uh, technologies faster and uh, in a more robust way. Uh, and what I believe that is required is uh, this linking element, this glue. Uh, between design and fabrication, which is uh, the data-driven digital workflows. So, uh, thank you very much. This was my presentation. I will now stop sharing. Uh, and I would like uh, to introduce you uh, to uh, Matt Rollins. Uh, he's coming here today uh, from uh, ABB, which is uh, a leading robotic manufacturer and solutions provider. Uh, Matt is now uh, leading uh, the ABB Robotics uh, UK drive as business development manager uh, to promote automation within the construction industry. Uh, and having previously enjoyed several roles across various industries within automation and robotics over the past 17 years, uh, he draws from his extensive range of knowledge and involvement in the introduction of innovative technology to deliver return on investment. Uh, so Matt, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we have been having uh, like very interesting discussions the past few months, uh, uh, also seeing your perspective, uh, having worked uh, extensively in manufacturing as well. Um, we would be happy to hear uh, your point of view uh, today uh, on the introduction of uh, robotic technologies in construction. Thank you very much, Eva, for uh, for that uh, great introduction. So uh, we'll um, I'll sort of uh, take in the the last slot. We'll try and make uh, make it sort of uh, as interesting as we can. So hopefully, yeah, um, yeah. I'm just going to share my screen now and. Uh, Please tell me when you can see that. Yes, we can see. Okay, super. Okay, so um, what I want to just go through is um, go through a little bit about the current construction landscape and how robotics uh, can help um, technology migration um, from other technologies, uh, from other industries. Because I think there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of stories there to, uh, to be told and a lot of learning that's already been done. Um, growing trend towards automation in robotics uh, in construction. You know what? What does that mean? How is this happening? What's what are the catalysts behind that? And, and how do we think robots can help with that? All of that. Um, how can robotics uh, benefit? Uh, how can construction, sorry, benefit from robotics? And um, you know what are the benefits there? And th there's a lot of that's already been answered. And in, in even so we're starting to see a lot of that um, as it becomes a little bit more commonplace and we get those early adopters starting to uh, start to come about. Um, you now, what are the challenges? I think Eva's touched on some of those challenges already. Um, you know, what needs to change to, to kind of really fully adopt um, the, the, the automation? And, and, and then finally, sort of what is the future of, you know, we've touched on this idea of a manufactured house uh, and that's what uh, you know, makes have a look at, you know, what does that look like? What do we think the possibilities are? So um, I'll start off with um, with this little image, really, which um, which I think pretty much for me sums up um, two sort of industries uh, that took very very different routes uh, and, and as a consequence have had a very very different journey over the last hundred years. Um, whereas construction has 
pretty much you know a house today uh, and I happen to find sort of uh, these are images from this was a, an image from 1920 uh, and this is a, an image from sort of last year and you know if those were <laughs> those could almost be built in the same year you know they look very much the same since very similar construction uh, techniques and all of this hasn't changed and I think a lot of that is because it hasn't had to change it hasn't really been that that uh, that driver behind it where when we look at automotive, um, there's been a lot of different demands on the automotive industry. And if we think of, of Henry Ford and the, the original production line that, um, and how that kind of evolved, um, there was all of a sudden a demand for, for vehicles for, for personal transport. And it only took that one early adopter, which was Henry Ford back in the day, to really, really change the way that a production and a, and a car goes together and how, and, and it, it created, it reduced the, the, the price of the vehicle because the demand was driving it. Uh, and then all of a sudden we had a situation where from, I think it was something like um, 400 different car companies uh, across the States, um, that reduced to around about, that, redu that um, reduced to around about 80. Uh, and that was all purely and simply because people who own businesses that didn't jump on board, they got completely left behind. And as that whole production evolved, the production line evolved, it, it then in turn evolved the vehicle. So we, saw, we see a lot of things of where the vehicle evolves and the production uh, evolves. And those two hand in hand, completely move the game on to a point that if we look at a, um, a car factory now compared to what it was even 50, 60 years ago, it's almost unrecognizable. The same uh, with a vehicle. If we look at um, the performance of a vehicle, if we look at the, uh, the quality, uh, I mean, back even 20, 30 years ago, um, we used to see a phenomenal amount of more breakdowns and, and more reliable cars than we do we do today. I mean, you, you simply don't really have a truly unreliable car nowadays, and and that's and that's a lot because, driven by the manufacturing process. So, and I, th I believe we're we're at the cusp, or the construction industry is at the cusp of, the, of that tipping point, um, where we've got demand is going is going up for houses. Um, there's a, there's a huge skills shortage, um, legislation and quality uh, demands are, are increasing. So we're getting to a point where, where all of a sudden the industry needs to change. There are, there are problems that need to be solved and, and automation is, is one way of, uh, of achieving that. Um, and again, if we look at sort of some more comparables uh, between other industries and the construction industry, um, we see a relatively low, and when I see that number of fifty-five percent, I mean this was this was based on a on a on a poll that ABB did. So we we basically we, we canvassed the uh, the construction industry to have a look at what's really happening out there. What did people see as the problems, and trying to get some data around uh, what was happening, and then. Um, I mean, we know that the, the, the skill shortage is, is, is a problem. Um, and we are starting to see robotics, but I, I suspect that 55% is very much um, people just literally just testing the waters. People who've tried a robot, maybe got one robot, but I don't really believe that's fully, a company's fully embracing uh, automation. Um, and I guess that some of the safety statistics um, I found were, were incredible. So four times more likely to be involved in a, in a fatal accident if you work in, in, in construction than in any other industry. Um, again, that's something that again has to be has to be addressed. Um, there's lots of there's lots of uh, obviously benefits to to going with um, automation uh, quality. Um, Delivery schedules. Uh, one of the things that we can't control, particularly in this country, is the weather. Even in the middle of July, it seems we get torrential rain. Um, and the ability to control that production environment means that we take away those unknown variables. Um, 
Uh, and I think probably one of the biggest um, gains uh, is, is waste. Um, again, completely new to me as I, when I started to look at uh, the construction industry about 18 months ago uh, within within my new role, I was, I was astounded to, to see just how much waste. So 25, 25 to 30% of a, of a construction build it ends up as waste. Uh, and, and to me, that, I mean, that's, if, the, if that was in the automotive industry, they, they would be out of business. Uh, and, and, and those num numbers are frightening. If you look at the automotive industry uh, and how, how narrow some of the margins are, um, the difference between success and failure is, 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 is incredibly small. And I think because, of, and that's only achieved because of the production process and the automation that, that goes into it, it enables you to do that. And, and that huge window of, of, of margin forever that we have in construction, it has to be reduced. And the only way to do that is through, uh, through automation. So um, one of the things that, um, if we look at robotics and, and what, um, uh, what's happening with in robotics, we've seen a huge change in how accessible robots are. And I think this is going to be a huge driver for the construction industry. Gone are the days where you, you had to have incredible knowledge of robot systems and programming and code to be able to actually program uh, robots. It's becoming far easier to be able to do those things and a lot of the software developments uh, and the way that we can link that software into um, uh, external software to create um, to create different bits of code is and, and robot motion I think is a, is a huge driver um, safety again is, is a big big um, driver uh, within automation we, we've seen a hell of a lot of of functionality around safety within robots and the way that we can collaborate with, with humans so that, that there are there are still and there always will be jobs where humans and, and, and people are required. Um, so the ability to be able to split and say the robots can do the, the bits that they're good at and the value adds stuff that humans are good at, we can still uh, we can still involve so we get the best of both worlds. Uh, I'm just going to just play this short video just to give you a little bit of a of a uh, an idea of what has happened uh, in in robotics and uh, how the uh, it's evolved. I'm just going to turn the sound down a little bit. So when we track industrial robots, you know, 1805 is pretty much when we uh, when we when we really see the start of it. Then the 1920s, as we mentioned, um, with uh, Henry Ford and the production line, we start to see um, the introduction of the idea of, of, uh, of automation. And it was only in sort of 1974, which is relatively recent history, um, where the what we call microprocessors, so the, the robot as we as we call it, as we recognize it today, um, really started off that um, that whole movement. And since then. The automotive industry, yes, that's led the way, but it's it's opened up so many other industries. So we see automotive as the leader in, in automation and robotics. But if we look at what's happened and how all of that gets translated into other industries, it's it's really quite interesting. And and all the accuracy of robots has has, has increased massively. The accessibility, um, the collaborative journey, and this is again it's opened up. A, whole load of doors for, for, for many, many different industries. So um, technology migration, I so said we touched on this and, and where we've got lots and lots of different um, applications really that may have started in automotive and they've then translated into uh, other industries. And we start to see that, that, that bridging of, of that journey towards construction. So just to take a few examples, so um, headliner uh, dashboard trimming, um, all done robotically in, in, in automotive. It has been done for many, many years. Um, we look at trimming of baths and hot tubs in general industry. 
the same kind of uh, same things. We've maybe got a few uh, a few more um, challenges uh, with some of the materials that are used in general industry and also in construction being a little bit more variable. But with the ability to scan and and collect data, that problem goes away because we can then all of a sudden adapt. Um, and we've even got robots scanning and then cutting that that, that can uh, that can generate those, those kind of programs and those kind of applications. Um, so taking that into construction, trimming of wall panels for um, modular offsite builds, all that kind of thing. Um, same with, um, with with welding. I mean, welding's a, a quite an interesting one because it because it, it it comes in and sort of links very closely to some of the projects we're working on at the moment with um, uh, modular sort of steel structures. Again, here's, a, here's a, an example for, for, of what I was just talking about where we, we've, got, we've got trimming in, auto, uh, in automotive, in general industry, we've got trimming of hot tubs, we've got tr uh, trimming of, of uh, marble uh, components, and then down a little video in, in the corner, uh, you can see we have robots handling and then uh, trimming it sort of interior um, uh, wall panels. Robotic arc welding, uh, and this this is this is one where I think ties in in very very neatly. Um, we've got some some really substantial pieces of of, uh, of equipment that uh, that we've worked with before for the likes of Caterpillar, um, where we've got huge dumper truck bodies that um, we have to weld. Um, the little video that you can see in the corner, top corner, uh, that's a company called Maybe Bridge. Now, Maybe Bridge make um, temporary uh, bridges for, um, for all different kind of uh, applications all, all across the world. Um, and the issues and challenges that they see are very, very similar to what we see in the construction industry. You're dealing with, generally speaking, large work pieces. Um, you have to control those work pieces. You're trying to put those work pieces together. It's not like a um, uh, perhaps where a man would would take a, a piece and they could adapt and and tweak and and uh, with what and work with what they've got with a with an automated system and a robot. Everything has to be fixtured. If you over over constrain everything, then you introduce uh, additional stresses. So you need to have the material coming in needs to be within tolerance. Now, the problem is that traditionally um, I-beam section, box section steel, the tolerances aren't great. You're talking huge big lengths uh, of steel and over six meters, you can have some quite large variability. So how do you handle that? And a lot of these problems have already been solved um, with, with some of these applications you see here. So all of that learning gets transferred into uh, construction. So some of those problems and some of those, uh, those problems uh, and barriers are only perceived barriers because they've already been solved in other industries. Riveting and joining. Um, how do we join different materials together? Again, automotive industry has been doing it for years um, with, example the Jaguar um, I think it's the XJ was the first um, uh, riveted body aluminium body that was put together um, we're doing that with scaffolding towers uh, for, for a company where we're riveting um, boards to to aluminium no different to uh, internal stud work that could be plasterboard onto um, onto um, uh, aluminium uh, or uh, light steel framework so we are seeing a a trend, as we mentioned before, with urbanisation, uh, increasing the demand that we need, labour shortages. But we're also seeing individualisation. And this is something that I think um, Eva touched on it earlier, that um, variability is almost the uh, the enemy of, uh, of automation. Uh, and I think, yes, traditionally that has been an issue, but we're starting to see, I mean, if you look at when you go and buy a car now, um, more and more options are available. Uh, I think we're, I worked on the, um, uh, the, the, the new Evoke uh, that came out sort of last year and um, the, the different combinations, it was something like 15 
um, hundred, so 1,500 different potential uh, variable, variable, different vehicles you could create. So all of that has to be has to be put into the uh, into the production line. So automation, particularly robotics, gives that it gives us a huge amount of flexibility. But we have to start looking in and understanding where the individualization can come from because there's a lot there's a lot of um, parts of a build that does it really matter if um, a room in a house in this street or a house in that street is 10 centimeters bigger. No, it doesn't. So if, if, if we look at the parts of a building where variability, we don't need to have variability, it gives us the ability to kind of look at where can we add individualization. And, and, and actually automation can give us some really, really interesting um, designs that, that have been that, that come out of the computational design, which I think Eva was uh, was looking at earlier. Um, and you know, I always say the future is now. It, it really is. There are so many different applications that that, that we're looking at, from research and, and development through to on-site robotics, 3D printing uh, of houses, uh, steel modular build. Uh, wooden laminate construction, uh, and I'll sort of go through some of these uh, these examples in a minute. And, and, and you know, there was a huge amount of work done um, on the, uh, the the Defab house in um, uh, in Zurich, uh, where we were basically the house was designed around um, modern methods of manufacturing. You know, pushing the boundaries. You know. What can we achieve? And there was a lot of things. There was there was some really really interesting sort of outputs of that. And that um, I think traditionally in construction, a lot of things are over engineered because we don't know whether a man is going to fix um, that that beam in the correct position. We don't know is he going to put the nail in the right place. Where all of a sudden, when we do this robotically or or automate it. We know all of these variables, so we we can we can engineer out that uh, that um, uh, that error factor, or at least reduce it. Uh, and we saw um, uh, structures reducing in weight, uh, reducing in the in the required amount of material because we could put a piece of wood at an exact angle and fix them in exact in exact points. Um, concrete pr constru uh, construction. Interestingly, I saw uh, recently what. Um, one of the, I think it's in the in the Netherlands, um, the first um, 3D printed house, um, uh, the first owners uh, effectively had moved in, um, and they are now living in in that uh, in in that um, building. And there's some very interesting um, shapes that we can that we can create. Um, and again, we talk about wastage, and um, and the the fact that we're only using exactly the, right, the, the amount of material that, that we need. Um, On-site robotics is an interesting one, and Eva again touched on it earlier, that um, sometimes we, I think we approach things in a slightly different, um, maybe the wrong way. Um, we look at how traditionally things have been done and what do we need to do to, uh, to replicate that and, and, and remove that man from that task. And, I think the the example of the bricklaying robot was a very very good example. Where um, why do we have straight walls? Well, we have straight walls because they're easy to build, and we've always traditionally uh, bricks um, are uh, you know the tolerance of brick is half a brick. When you build a wall, it, the, the tolerances are huge. So if we're trying to automate things. Do we not want to take a step back and look at is there a better way of doing it? Because the only reason we build a wall, wall the way we build it is because it's easy for a man to build. If we introduce different technology, then all of a sudden we have we open up so much more potential and possibility. But what it doesn't do is completely remove the need for um, uh, activities on site. And one of the biggest things we know, come back to my comment earlier uh, at the findings that you know, you're four, more, four, four times more likely to get seriously injured um, on a construction site uh, than you are in any other industry. So we clearly need to make that safer. And there's a lot of things we can do um, with robotics to help that. And this is a, a, an example where we have um, a, 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 an access uh, frame. 
the idea is that it gets scanned. This is this was Hal Robotics that uh, developed this solution uh, to drill um, at height within uh, within buildings, particularly when we look talking rework rework of existing buildings. Um, we've got some on-site examples here where we've got uh, a building of, 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 uh, of steel frames again. Taking, taking uh, the, the manufactured house to, to the next uh, stream. We've got building of, um, of struts and, and, and wooden framework. Um, but a little bit more about that um, uh, shortly. So uh, if we look at sort of where, where we've got, uh, and we saw that number of 55% um, percent of companies using robots in construction, I actually think that if we look at the number of robots, um, it would be significantly less um, than automotive uh, and, and, and manufacturing. Uh, so where are the benefits? Health and safety, we've mentioned this already. Labor shortage, um, again, that problem is, is reduced. Uh, and one of the big things is when we bring new technology, we've seen it in many other industries, bring new technology into the, to the workplace, it attracts um, new, new people. Um, the younger generation that are coming into the workplace, the technology is a driver. We want they want to work in nice environments, uh, and and this is where we can make interesting, um, appealing work environments. Uh, productivity, thirty percent increased productivity. It's something that um, even in a lot of, uh, of general industry, it's still a problem. Uh, and uh, uh, over the last four or five years, I've been heavily involved in working with um, new businesses to automation. So people who've never had automation before. And despite how much uh, we, we can show as data and in theory about how much people will um, increase productivity will increase, they're always, always astounded and amazed when it really does deliver. Uh, innovation, I think there's so much uh, design possibilities that we aren't even seeing or we aren't even touching on yet. And I'll finish with uh, this this video really of, of uh, we've got quality, speed, and efficiency um, being demonstrated with this uh, house of design where we're building uh, wooden panels, uh, modular builds flat pack homes in effect in the US. Flexibility, you know, we mentioned that variability. Well, robots have got a really, really good ability to be able to be flexible. Um, and we need to be, we need to be, uh, make all sorts of different sizes of rooms uh, and walls. This is a, a construction of um, volumetric uh, buildings. Again, we touched on some of the, the difficulties with that. Um, and we need to be able to grade and understand the, the, the material coming in. This is a, um, a really, really nice example of a really good use of um, on-site robotics um, that uh, Schindler put, um, implemented. And we have working at height is, 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 a, is a, a real hazard. Um, so particularly drilling, using uh, equipment, just drill equipment on, on site. This system, in effect, climbs the, the elevator shaft, scans, drills, and places the bolts and the fixings required, uh, re massively reducing the, uh, the need for, for on-site labor. And that can be done autonomously so that we don't uh, we maximize uh, all working uh, time so we can work around the clock with very, very uh, minimal supervision and human input. This is a group, uh, an interesting example of um, rebar tying. Um, this robotic example of rebar tying, which was uh, uh, Skanska uh, in Sweden, I, I believe um, it, it meant uh, they could increase sixfold their um, volume that uh, production they could uh, uh, of material they could use. And I'm aware of the time, so I'm going to just jump uh, jump through this, uh, this 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 section. 
So we do still have a number of, of, uh, of challenges. Uh, I think fragmentation is, is, uh, is, is a challenge. At the moment, the current landscape within constru construction is there's lots of different companies coming together, bringing lots of different pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. And automation requires all of those inputs to be relatively controlled. Um, so we need to start not just focusing on construction. And I think there's a lot of activity around that, but also the supply chain. The supply chain needs to understand. And in turn, they will see some of the benefits. We touched on material tolerance. Um, but again, traditionally, this hasn't really been an issue in construction. And we need to start looking at a little bit more uh, around um, top material tolerance and, and, and the supply chain supplying into construction. And perception, I think that's the, that for me, that seems to be one of the biggest barriers. Um, it's the general public's perception of what a modular build is. Um, and people think of modular build and prefabricated uh, construction, and they think about post war era. Um, concrete houses uh, and there's not really that there's that um, almost reluctance to to, uh, to move uh, with something that they don't know so there's some work that needs to be done on that to, to, to try and understand that actually there's a lot of benefits we mentioned some of the perceptions around um, it's very restrictive and uh, people think that um, automating can be restrictive on, on, on design uh, but we are seeing actually in uh, that there's a lot of there's a lot of really exciting things that can be done, um, and this is this is this is uh, an example. Um, we were involved um, with the Vignali um, exhibition in um, in Venice uh, earlier this year, and um, where we were looking at you know how do we create different in interesting shapes uh, that can go together, and that was uh, some some quite interesting uh, outputs of, of that uh, using it's an effect um, 3D printing um, in organic uh, material. So we'll come back to um, you know what I mentioned earlier about the computational design, um, various different advances in, in technology should actually open up um, design uh, within construction, so we should be able to see different uh, different um, ideas, different construction methods. Or if we just look at some of the things on 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 this page um, that, that that we can see, um, the things that there's only, we can only make these uh, either robotically or, or by or, or some form of automation, uh, and this is where I think really we should start exploring the. Uh, the things that we haven't really been considered um, and think about really, really rethink really about how we can design a house. Uh, some really interesting, this is an um, uh, example of, of, of a project um, that Zahar Hadid are working on in uh, Honduras. Um, and I think it really breaks the concept uh, or the preconception that um, modular build and prefabricated houses are are boring this isn't uh, and and there's a lot of customization in here you know the ability you know we come back to the idea of how you build the car you can choose your options you know you so you can easily customize the various different parts of of, of, your, of your of your house um way way more than uh, you probably could with a traditional build where that room is how it is because that's how it's been designed so we should actually be able to see more flexibility uh, rather than uh, rather than less thank you very much i hope hopefully that's uh, giving you a little bit of an overview uh, whistle stop tour uh, of uh, of what uh, of what we see um, the future of in uh, in construction for robotics thank you very much matt uh, this was a really a great presentation. Uh, I would like to open up the discussion uh, to our participants to uh, ask questions. Uh, Stunned silence. <laughs> <laughs> I think you amazed them all. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, there's so much to talk about. Um, but I guess just from what I'm thinking, what I would like to know. So, so I'm like a junior structural engineer, um, actually I work for AKT2, but I mean, I mean, what could I do 
if I go into work like next week, um, what's like something that I could do that would help to bring in kind of robotics to this whole kind of picture of construction from the structure engineering side, if that makes sense. It's a, it's a good question. And I think, um, I think it's, um, I think individually it's very, it's difficult to make a, a marked um, difference. Uh, but I think um, opening up the conversation, I think is, is key. Um, it's understanding, um, it's under, and it's being ready to, to, to move. Uh, that what we're really trying to do is take some of the, um, the, 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 Key construction and contractor industries, and understand how can we, how can they start to evolve, um, and and we just need to be ready. I think uh, certainly structural engineers they need to be ready uh, to understand um, how um, how does robotics impact um, what you are doing, uh, and I think some of the things that uh, we, we maybe sort of touched on earlier uh, around um, you know. The, the way that we build and the way we, we put things together. At the moment, I, I'm, I'm guessing I'm not a structural engineer, so please sort of uh, um, excuse some of my maybe naivety. But if you're if you're putting um, a structural um, design together or structural engineering uh, together, you're looking at various different ways that those uh, pieces are joined, and maybe there are some tolerances in there that are factored in because of the way that it would it is constructed it has to be constructed uh, through a manual process does that change if um if um, uh, we do that um robotically or, or by automated process um and and that's the kind of thing questions i think we need to, to think about and ask mm -hmm. yeah yeah definitely if, uh, no go on no I, I would just like to add on that uh linking it to a point that uh, matt mentioned towards the end uh regarding the fragmentation of our industry. I think it's important to keep in mind that robotics are the answer to a much bigger problem of creating like an integrated design workflow from material extraction to design assembly, material user, material decon uh, building deconstruction. So I think at the moment, at least when I was working in the industry, you were I was in an architectural practice, so we were focusing more on the, on the design. And then you had the structural engineer that was focusing just on the structural analysis of the yeah. design. Then you had the contractor who would just focus on how do I build this thing? But I think the first step is to try and think that whatever I do is part of a much wider process. And if you start thinking about how your decisions affect this whole process or trying and identify the problems or possibilities for improvement it, within the whole process, then you can start identifying that, okay, this part could probably be much better if you would use this, like if you would automate this, or this part works actually quite well as it is and it doesn't need a lot of work. But somehow trying to think about the whole design process and project development stage from zero to demolition eventually. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, it will sound very obvious, but uh, uh, I, I deeply believe that even the fact that uh, you guys are all here uh, for three days uh, learning uh, or willing to learn about uh, how robotics can be used in the industry is really the first step and uh, even uh, the way you formed your question, James, uh, says a lot about it. Uh, the fact that you said, what can I do to help uh, like implement these technologies? This is actually uh, the very first step to understand that we need to communicate between disciplines. So as uh, like we have an architectural and engineering background, uh, myself and Antiope, uh, we are also uh, like speaking to other engineers, other architects. Uh, I have worked with robotics, but I know that, for example, Matt has a much bigger experience than me. Uh, in construction, we always have uh, this uh, very bad attitude uh, of thinking that one discipline is better than the other. Uh, 
not exchanging information. Information gets lost after each project uh, is finished and the team uh, has uh, like split. And for some reason, we like suing each other too much. Uh, so liabilities uh, are like one of the main issues. Um, so for me, it's like really, it sounds like an idealistic approach, but uh, we need to change our mentality. We need to work together because what really revolutionized manufacturing is the fact that it's one company making one product throughout the way. So uh, the decisions being made have the, the goal to make that product. Now in construction with the fragmentation that we have, each one uh, kind of takes their own decisions, uh, think that their decision is the best or better than anybody else's, and that's the wrong approach. That's not how we will be able to uh, like, uh, create and evolve our industry to, to create a disruption. Uh, and it's not about robotics in the sense that uh, automation and robotics will solve all our problems. But if we start uh, understanding these tools that we can use to make things better and start seeing the benefits and working towards the benefits more uh, rather than uh, being negative and seeing the obstacles. Uh, as Antiope said, like if we start thinking about how will our work affect other disciplines and we start taking the initiative to create or like work with companies that create digital workflows that link disciplines uh, and seek this within projects, uh, for me it's the very beginning. And of course, uh, it all comes back to like, if it's a concentrated effort, for example, the architects, they have uh, a much closer relationship with the client uh, most of the times, uh, rather than the contractor, let's say. So whoever can drive decisions, if they have this uh, like coordination and communication with the rest of the disciplines, then the effect can be much bigger. I think that an another big problem almost uh, here in Italy is uh, that we have a, a, a lot of uh, a small company in uh, construction industry, also in the manufacturing, uh, um, talking about uh, wood uh, timber manufacturing, um, all, all these small company, uh, it's hard to um, explain the benefit to um, that innovation can bring, that the robotics can bring to uh, their work. So they don't want to uh, invest money in this uh, in this sense. Um, in my PhD, I contacted uh, several um, uh, industry timber industry uh, that made uh, some wood construction, uh, timber construction. As, at, at uh, um, all uh, small company because uh, uh, in Italy we we have a, um, uh, a lot of small companies, small and medium enterprise. Not there's not uh, a lot of big company, so it's uh, it's very. Um, I find uh, like a wall uh, when I propose. Uh, uh, we want to introduce some uh, um, automation uh, in your workflow. Uh, we can bring. Uh, we can have this. Uh, um, this, uh, the, the, uh, uh, this benefit, and they uh, doesn't want uh, they uh, didn't want to um, uh, listen because they don't want to uh, spend money because they say uh, I produce only uh, 20 uh, 15 uh, hours uh, uh, per year, so I don't need a robots to do uh, this task. It's enough for me having uh, some CNC machine uh, and, uh, and and I don't know, but they don't understand the, the flexibility of the robotic fabrication. I think that it's a very important uh, point: the, the flexibility of this kind of system. They can uh, can um, make uh, um, make some improvement uh, in the the workflow. No, they can make. Uh, other other task uh, uh, in with the, with the same machine we can they can use the machine with, with different tasks 
in the in the same uh, uh, workflow maybe you know uh, and i think it is it's uh, very important but it's very hard to uh, um, to manage with this this problem uh, you know and that is always the difficulty with um, smaller businesses investing in automation because it is quite a big investment uh, particularly when we uh, um, it is you, you often see um, the two extremes for early adopters. You see the very, very large companies, but you also see some of the, 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 the smaller companies because one of the things that smaller companies do have a, 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 as an advantage is they can be a lot more agile, a lot more flexible in, 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 in adopting new technologies and new processes where sometimes some of the large companies struggle, but investment is always, is always difficult. Um, but if they can get the right backing, um, and often it's it's about adapting. Uh, those smaller businesses will have to adapt because because as construction evolves and it changes and more automation is introduced, um, they will be either forced into very bespoke type houses and, and almost a quite a niche uh, area, or they will have to adapt. And and, and I well, we believe that. They, they will actually, some of these smaller companies may even start to, uh, to, to change and adapt so that they, they make a certain part of, of a building or a certain, uh, certain um, element of it. So they almost become a supply chain into the, 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 some of the larger companies. So I think we'll see a big change over the coming years, but uh, I totally agree. And it's the same with every industry. Um, it's that availability of investment. Um, but there are a huge amount of, certainly in the UK, incentives uh, from a, um, from the government to uh, to be able to develop that. So hopefully that will that will continue. Uh, just to add on top of that, um, like to to present a different perspective, I would say that I don't blame them. Like for them, it's a reasonable uh, thought that uh, they don't need that investment. Uh, at the beginning, I had the same degree of annoyment uh, uh, as you do, uh, Roberto, uh, because I have uh, spoken with a lot of companies that uh, they have really shown me uh, that they, they present that they, they can do everything, uh, like even with carbon fiber and everything, and then they come down to the fact that uh, there are three workers manually uh, uh, like trying to sand uh, the very advanced carbon fiber on other aspects uh, structure uh, for three days. And uh, when I discuss this with them, uh, they just mention, but what do you mean? Like labor here is very cheap. Why would I change anything? Mm -hmm. So this is one of the biggest obstacles, like Mark mentioned, the perception. Uh, but there comes a point where uh, at least I realized that I cannot blame them. It's their business. They have built that business from their sweat. They are small companies and they don't want to take the risk. So instead of uh, seeing it as uh, like a problem that we cannot overcome, uh, that's why I am of the opinion, and that's what I try to do at Data From Love, is to help them de-risk that uh, investment, do some extra effort uh, and some extra work uh, to show them that it's not just about talking. We can literally show them that if you implement robotics in that way, that many robots, and that's how it plugs in in what you already do, then in one year or a year and a half, so put numbers, you can have your return on investment and then you can start increasing uh, productivity. It is uh, like quite challenging to convince people already, uh, but it only comes uh, with uh, like creating a network of uh, interested people. So for sure, there are gonna be many people that uh, disagree and uh, resist. Uh, change and as Matt uh, is saying uh, probably those when the time comes and everybody has uh, incorporated those changes they will be uh, uh, like far behind uh, in the line but there are always uh, early adopters 
in every industry. It's just about a matter of finding them. If I can just add to that, I think it's also important to take into account the role that government and policies have to play in that. I mean, I, I completely agree with, with what Eva said that you cannot blame them. And I think that it's the role of a government to give them the incentive to try that. And there's different type of policies that you can make. For example, you can have one, comp like the government can invest in one company that can be like a prototype and then other companies can imitate it. It can give small motives like, for example, if I have a company and I invest in automation, I get some tax release or like, I'm not a policy expert by no means, but uh, working in timber construction, there, there is a very big impact that policies can make, whether they're local, like at the local government scale or at the national scale or at the European scale or international scale. I think it's very important for, uh, for this incentive to be given so, so progress doesn't solely reply, uh, rely on individuals who are willing to take the risk or who can afford to take the risk. Yeah. Yes, of course. I think that, but, but you have to think that uh, um, uh, we have some policy in Italy for uh, uh, investment uh, investment in that in that kind of uh, uh, industry for Poro. But uh, uh, there's no uh, the, the the mentality uh, to and, and the approach to change. Because uh, you know, uh, some companies are in, uh, are smarter, so they take this kind of policy and go on. But uh, uh, in the construction uh, uh, industry, there's um, a, a lot of uh, uh, they build wall, as I said before, and they uh, they can't see uh, forward. They can they can make a step forward. You know, uh, we 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 have to wait. Uh, uh, some other years uh, for the this kind this uh, change of mentality because uh, uh, it's um, you know uh, uh, I, I'm talking for uh, my uh, for my point of view and, and my um, uh, nation my Italy no there is this uh, um, uh, a, a very big 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 challenge because uh, uh, the small uh, company that uh, are not innovating. Uh, are the most one are are the uh, are they the construction uh, the, the the most uh, of uh, the building in, in Italy? They they, they have uh, they, they work uh, more, no? Uh, so mm -hmm. is this the problem? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be. I think only time will tell. I think it's going to be yeah, one of those things, yeah, see how it evolves. But uh, we can only, all we can do is focus on the areas we can change um, and, uh, and work on. And there's certainly plenty of those to, to, that we're, we're working with. So, uh, but yeah, very interesting. I unfortunately will have to leave very shortly. So, but uh, I, that, uh, thank you very much, everyone, for, uh, uh, for, uh, yeah, for listening and uh, very interesting uh, discussions. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Matt, for joining us and for a very interesting presentation. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Okay, take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. So I will uh, stop the streaming now.